The Lord be with you. And also with you. A very warm welcome uh, this morning. Uh, beautiful day outside. Uh, sun streaming in. It's lovely. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, everything you need will be in the service sheet. Um, but we're going to begin our time uh, with hymn 538. shall love the Lord with your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. <coughs> Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Uh, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. 
at the first prayer of confession. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault in thought and word and deed and in what we have left undone. We are heartily sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly put, put, repent, have mercy upon you and upon me. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> together the collect for today, the 18th Sunday after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Genesis. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over, rule over fish, the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw that all he had made and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. 
The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, let's stand and sing our, our next hymn, si- hymn 670, I Waited for the Lord My God. to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus anointed at Bethany. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <coughs> May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do be seated. <coughs> uh, well, as you might have seen on some of the term cards or the poster coming in, uh, for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about this question of poverty. Um, w- w- what is it about... 
And what is our response to it as disciples of Jesus? But before we get there, I just want to ask a fairly simple question first, and that is, why are we talking about this now? Because on one hand, the answer is pretty obvious. You know, there's a cost of living crisis, uh, poverty is being talked about everywhere, so you know, why shouldn't we uh, think about it in church too? Uh, but I just want to push us a bit further than that, because Jesus told us in that reading that the poor are always with you. And by that, he didn't mean it in a sort of fatalistic way, you know, there will always be poor people, so you know, nothing will ever change, don't even bother trying. Um, when he was saying that, the poor are always with you, he was quoting from Deuteronomy 15, where God says, there will always be poor people in the land, therefore I command you to be open-handed. Uh, in other words, poverty is a persistent problem which demands a persistent response. Uh, so yeah, it, it's great to be talking about poverty now, but that kind of raises the question, why weren't we sort of doing it before in the same way? You know, um, if poverty is, is always with us, why is it only now uh, that the, sort of the nation and indeed the church is perhaps giving it the airtime it deserves? Uh, you know, is it because we've all become champions of the poor or is it because poverty has somehow just become a little bit more personal, affecting perhaps me or people like me or people I care for a bit more than just a generic poor person out there? Um, do you get what I'm sort of saying? Yeah. And the honest answer is it's probably a bit of both, you know. Um, and, and I do hope that the sort of current situation has sort of genuinely stirred us up, you know, to have a bit of a change of heart and a realisation about the importance of talking about poverty. Uh, but we're going to be naive if we think our hearts are just going to change overnight. Uh, because there's something about the, uh, the, the problem of poverty that's not only a persistent problem out there in the world, but is also a persistent problem within us. And acknowledging something of that complexity, something of that mixed motivation, actually turns out to be really important when we talk about dealing with poverty, not just sort of one-off, stick some cash in the tin, but as something that is a long-term work of the people of God as disciples of Jesus Christ. We've got to talk about what's happening inside as well as just the needs that are happening outside. And we actually, we get a... Um, we get a fairly extreme example of this business of mixed motivation, again, in that gospel reading we just had. And it comes from Judas Iscariot, because on the one hand, there he is advocating poverty relief. You know, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Yeah, poverty relief. And some of it would have been, wouldn't it? And yet, on the other hand, he's also very much aware that the poor won't be the only ones to benefit. You know, verse 6, he'll get his cut as well. Get it? Mixed motivations, and okay, uh, probably not most of us are going to be quite like Judas Iscariot there, um, but there's always going to be some sort of disconnect between what we say and what we do, or what, what we say we want and what we really want. Um, and and recognising that is a really important thing to do at the start of the journey towards engaging well with poverty, both as individuals, as churches, as communities, and indeed as nations of the human race. And let me just give you a personal example of that. Um, the whole tax cuts for growth thing, and I have no idea what the current political situation of that is or not, but uh, when it was first announced, uh, I, I, you know, okay, people who know me will know that uh, the, sort of the whole tax cuts for growth thing, it's not something I uh, agree with sort of politically, economically, and not really theologically either. You know, It's not my thing. Except when it was announced, I was probably thinking, ooh, I wonder what that means for me. And I went to the BBC website, so I sort of put it by details and found out just how much extra I'd be getting a week if the sort of tax rate dropped to 19% or whatever it was. And I was thinking, oh, suddenly this whole trickle down economics sounds a lot more tasty uh, when it's sort of uh, helping the poor means getting more money in their bank account. Do you anyone feel like that? Or is that just me only up to that? You know, uh, mixed motivations. Um, even though I sort of, I knew that you know, I, I don't agree with this politically, I think this is wrong, except I still went to the website and I was actually still secretly a little bit oh, disappointed when the sort of a new chancellor said it's probably not happening. I knew it was probably never going to happen, but there was something of that mixed, mixed motivation in my heart uh, that was going on. Um, uh, and let me give you another example, actually. Again, it's a personal one. So I talk about a poster we had with the bog roll, sort of on the, on the thing, or, you know, talk about Court Short, our title of the sermon series. Uh, now, we designed that for a whole number of reasons. Um, uh, but we wanted something provocative and eye-catching and stuff. But I w I won't, I'd be lying to you if I said part of the reason was I, I wanted people to notice and say, oh, St. Mary's is doing a thing on poverty. You know, because it was a kind of kudos, I suppose, in, in some way. of sort of, Oh, well, there's a church who's with the needs of the day or a church that's you know, caring for poor, in a sense. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, we, we, we're doing what churches need to be do. And I get to be a vicar of a church that's, that's engaging with the issues of the moment. 
do you kind of see the thing on the, on the sort of sparkly eye-catching poster? One of the things that was about it was actually that, that sense of, sort of ego polishing of, ooh, we're a church that's talking about important things like poverty kind of thing. Do, do you see? Or am I just getting a bit too personal there? But, but, but do, do you understand? There, there is this mixed motivation in the heart in all things that we do, particularly that's going um, uh, with, with these matters of poverty. Um, and and uh, you, you might say, does that really matter, Tim? Yeah, well, we've always got these mixed motivations. Uh, but you see, um, if, if part of the question we're trying to answer in these areas of poverty is, if we're trying to sort of answer alongside the question of poverty, um, questions about how do I want to feel better, or how do I want to look better, or how do I want to improve my social media profile, or how do I want to feel more in control in an out-of-control world, or how do I want to prove that my sort of morality is vindicated or my political worldview is vindicated. If it's all sorts of these other questions that we're trying to answer alongside and through the lens of poverty, then uh, th those motivations for engaging with the question of poverty are almost certainly going to be expressed in the solutions we are motivated to pursue in answer to poverty. Do you get it? That's why it matters, to understand and recognise the mixed motivations of the heart. Um, uh, let, me, let me take a, a, another example. This one's um, I, I know about because a, a friend of mine who's in ministry in Manchester. Um, and um, when, um, when, when the pandemic kicked off, lots of churches sort of, um, uh, as, as, you know, uh, I suppose after the sort of initial week or so, lots of churches begin to see a need in their community. And um, one of the ways they tried to answer that need was through opening up, sort of church, uh, they were opening up food banks uh, and sort of uh, food delivery schemes and that sort of stuff. Um, and both churches did this, and also just sort of local communities alongside churches did all this sort of thing. And the interesting thing is that, by and large, the results of those programs that were set up were, were pretty mixed. Uh, often, there was an awful lot of enthusiasm and commitment at the start. You know, people would give money, give food, uh, signing up to be volunteers, all that sort of thing. Um, but a lot of those projects, the same problem emerged. Uh, namely, that there was more coming in than was going out. Um, there was more food being given, more sort of time being volunteered than they had people to spend it on, as it were. And the reason wasn't because there wasn't need within those communities. Rather, it was because there was too much shame um, for people to access that. Um, even to sort of ring up anonymously and, and, and get food dropped off, there was too much shame. That, that, that shame was, was a barrier. Um, because here's the thing, uh, when you ring up a food bank, when you um, ring up someone uh, and to say, I, I need help, um, but in a sense, you're admitting that you are someone who is poor. You're admitting that you can't cope. You can't cope because of material poverty. You, know, you haven't got the money uh, because COVID has pushed you over the edge financially or whatever. Or it might be a different kind of poverty. Um, so, you know, who would need to access a community food bank like that? Well, you know, uh, maybe someone who doesn't know anyone else well enough in their own community to ask them to knit down the shops for them because they're having to self-isolate. But what does that phone call to a food bank look like then? Hello, mate, someone I don't know. Uh, can you knit down to cult for me because I don't know, because I, I don't know any friends? Okay? You're having to admit a, a, a poverty. It's not a material poverty necessarily, but you're still admitting a different kind of poverty. Um, and, um, and it's not that the community projects and the church projects set up to try and meet that need weren't well-meaning. They were incredibly well-meaning. Uh, and it wasn't that they didn't think through some of this stuff beforehand, yeah, but they talked about confidentiality and all that sort of thing. Uh, it just turns out that there is an incredibly, incredibly high shame threshold to, cra to cross as part of all discussions. And even worse than that... Um, it, it can turn out that the results that we have, even what we call and think of as good results, when they're unpacked, turn out perhaps not to be the kind of things we actually really think we wanted uh, in the end. Let me, let me, so let me come back to the church from Manchester. Um, so they, they did that whole food bank setup thing. Um, and uh, one of the stories that sort of came out when they sort of reflected it and sort of did some, some learning on this was of a youngish woman um, who'd, um, who came along to the food bank. Let me tell you her story. Uh, it'd taken a couple of days to pluck up the courage to go through the door. 
Um, and, and when she came through the door, she was the only one in there, okay? And she's the only person who'd been in so far that day. Um, and so there was lots and lots of food there, and there was lots and lots of very nice people there, and they were all trying to help, and uh, she was given way more food than she was expected, and no, she didn't need to pay for any of it, and, and you know, come back again soon, okay? And she didn't come back for about two months. Why? Well, the reasons that she gave, and these aren't her words, they're sort of words filtered for a friend who sort of actually helped her to reconnect with the church and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, 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 but the words that she basically gave was that when she came to the door, what she experienced in the well-meaning people who were setting up that sort of food bank and stuff and running it were essentially deeply frustrated activists who hadn't been out of the house for weeks. And they were all feeling frustrated and inadequate because they weren't making a difference. And here through the door came this poor person who they could help. And, and, and let's give her all they can because it's a bit embarrassing having this all, all this food sitting around that no one seems to be wanting. You know, and it doesn't look good in our social media profile if we have to put a notice saying, please don't bring any more food to our food bank because no one's wanting us to give it to them kind of thing. You know, so they, they, they'd done a big push in it at the start and had to walk back that campaign would be embarrassing. Um, and you know, oh, come along and bring along your friends so we can be sort of charitable to them too. And now I'm exaggerating um, the story, but do you, do you get the point of what I'm trying to get at? That whole thing about mixed motivations coming out in the way that these well-meaning poverty relief projects are being exercised. Uh, because think about it, uh, in order to walk through those doors, uh, in order to deal with her material poverty for just a week, uh, the woman, if you like, had to give up something of her self-worth. Uh, she had to let someone else see that she was failing in life, that she was a parent who couldn't provide for her children. In other words, by walking through those doors, uh, she became poorer in a way, not, not materially, but poorer in her being, in her sense of self-worth. And that came as a result of engaging with a poverty relief process. Uh, but the story goes on, you see, because um, although the church had said all this sort of stuff about we're going to do confidentiality and all that sort of thing, uh, the woman hadn't yet learned to trust the church. Uh, and she knew some of those people from the town. Um, and she knew that she might bump into them on the streets. And you know, would they ask her out on the streets about, oh, have you brought your friends to the food bank yet too? You know, there's that trust thing. Um, and um, you know, the, 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 um, the, the process, would you see how this sort of process unfolded? That, um, that it was focused on relieving one kind of poverty, um, but whether it sort of produced another kind of poverty in the process, well, maybe it did. Because, uh, and the thing, here's the thing, the people running the food bank didn't see it like that. Uh, because the experience from the people in the church was the complete opposite. You know, they wanted to give people in need food and feel like they had made a difference. So to them, it was mission accomplished, question answered. You know, they'd come to poverty with a question, how do you put food on people's mouths and how do we feel like made a difference? They had done just that. Uh, they, they had made a difference. Uh, and yet, it was only when the woman didn't come back the next week or the week after that or the week after that, and only when other people in similar situations didn't come back the next week or the week after that, that they realised they might have been asking the wrong question. Because at the end of the week, they had gained a sense of self-worth, uh, but in some senses at the expense of the woman's sense of self-worth. They had gained a sort of community respect, you know, another tick on our tally chart of the people the Church Food Bank has helped this week, and yet uh, the woman had in some sense lost her sense of belonging and, uh, and acceptance and, and sort of safety in a community. Um, and at the end of the week, the woman was out of food, only now she was not just materially still poor, but also in some sense poorer in other ways as well and less able to actually engage with that poverty relief process going on. Do you get, do you, does that make sense? And I, 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 it's quite a complicated story to tell first, second hand, as it were. And it's something which, I, I, it takes a while for Penny to drop to realize we're actually setting out the best motivations to help people and actually achieving what we set out to do. And yet, unless we understand poverty on a more fundamental level, unless we understand this stuff in a more reflective way, unless we actually um, listen to the poor and understand the poor, there's a real danger that our energies and our efforts and our uh, time and our money, it can go into answering the questions we want to answer, but it might not be answering the questions that need answering there in order to bring long-term change and long-term glory to Jesus Christ. Because, you know, that woman's experience was, here, here's what poverty reef looks like in the name of Jesus. 
I'm not coming back next week. Okay. Now, um, there's a load more to talk about that, and I, I've, I've told the story in an exaggerated way to make the point, but, but the point is one that is repeated in contexts throughout the world. It's one been one of the big learnings about engaging with poverty over the past 10 or 20 years uh, to realise that actually uh, there is a whole load of this mixed motivation stuff. Unless, unless we recognise that engagement at the start, uh, we may end up not uh, achieving all the stuff uh, that, that we're called to do so as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, because what the Bible gives us um, in terms of a vision for human flourishing it is not just a matter of getting food on tables. Uh, do you remember one of his sermons on, uh, on poverty? I think it's Luke 12. Jesus says, don't you know that life is more than food and the body more than clothes? Uh, that's something of a biblical understanding of, of, of what human being is, uh, being a human is about. You know, we heard in our first lesson about human beings are made in the image of God. Now, what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that we are made relationally in the image of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, and we're made to have these wonderful relationships that fill our lives with meaning and purpose. You know, relationship with God that gives us that sense of certainty and confidence and hope and, uh, and, and direction to our lives. Uh, relationship with ourselves. You know, recognizing some of the image of that wonderful God in us. And as a result of that, having a sense of dignity and worth in ourselves. Uh, having uh, relationships with, with each other and being fruitful and life-giving uh, you know, in every possible way in those relationships. And also having a, re a relationship with the rest of creation and uh, you know, caring for creation in a way that provides for our needs. That is what human life is about. And poverty fundamentally is a distortion of those relationships. You know, uh, it, it's about um, being a poverty of self, you know, not, 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 not having a sense of self-worth and dignity. Uh, a poverty of stewardship, which includes not being able to provide for our material needs, but also just not having a sense of, 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 of place in the world to work uh, and be a part of this care and these purposes uh, in the material creation. Uh, a poverty of community, you know, that sense of being disconnected uh, and deprived of the relationships we need to flourish. And ultimately, of course, a spiritual poverty not knowing intimacy with the God for whom's, of whose image we bear. And here's the thing. Um, in a broken world, of the world we live in today, the world that we call the fallen world, um, all of us are experiencing that kind of poverty. It's just that all of us want to deny it because none of us want to admit to being poor. And this hidden poverty within ourselves has a kind of driving effect on, the, on what we do and how we seek to engage with the work that, that is before us in poverty. You know, we, we realize that when we're engaging with vulnerable, needy people, we actually have an opportunity to begin to sort of use them and use their vulnerability to satisfy and meet some of these vulnerabilities within. Uh, it's what Paul talks about in Romans 7 when he says, you know, although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. These mixed motivations of the heart matter. They matter deeply. And if we don't begin to unpack them and recognize them and begin to understand something of our own inner poverty at the start of this journey towards trying to solve other people's poverty, we just end up in a very, very sticky mess. Make sense? That's as far as we're going today. And that sounds, that sounds a bit unsatisfying, Tim. I was expecting you to tell us what to do. We'll get onto that later on, but this is, this is the why starting point. This is, I, I'm not an expert in poverty. Um, I've had to read up and do a lot of mugging up on people who've been doing this for decades, people who've spent their whole lives making mistakes and trying to understand how to help churches and help Christians engage with poverty better. Um, there's a lot of diversity, a lot of different learning, a lot of different outcomes, but the thing that they all agree on is that the journey to poverty has to begin with that sense of humility and owning our poverty ourselves before we begin to sort of answer it in the lives of others. So, so there we are. That's our first week. Recognizing poverty relief is about more than food. Recognizing the mixed motivations that reveal that we too are poor. And as a result, realizing that if we're going to make headway as a church and as individuals in engaging with poverty in our world today, then there's spiritual work to do in us as part of our ongoing journey. Amen. Amen.
let's uh, stand and uh, declare the creed uh, to one another. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Uh, do please take a seat as Wendy comes to lead us in prayer. <coughs> Let us pray. God of grace, in the blazing beauty of this autumn, we confess that all we have comes from you. Make us sensitive in all our dealings with each other and your whole creation. May we imitate Mary's generosity in our lives and do your will here on earth. Let us use wisely your rich resources and not cease to seek ways of fairer trading and distribution among all nations. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. In this world of unspeakable suffering through natural causes or by human design, we lift up to you the peoples of Ukraine and Russia, the citizens of Iran, the victims of flood in Pakistan and the mine blast in Turkey, and those who suffer through war and drought in Somalia. We bring before you concerns for the rise of extreme politics in Europe and the Americas, the perpetrators of conspiracy theories and authors of destructive internet material. We ask for your shielding on those who risk their all to defend democracy and clean up dark channels of communication. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. As we face political and economic turmoil in our own fractured and fragmented kingdom, we pray for those who seek to govern and those who guide them. May they have servant hearts and act with honesty as they strive to steer us through these turbulent times.
honor those who seek to curb inflation, reduce waiting lists, and reform social services. And we pray for measures to meet the growing needs of those facing homelessness and to protect the welfare of immigrant children. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. yeah, our prayer. We are mindful of our freedom to worship here in this place and for those who serve us throughout the Anglican Communion. We thank you for the blessings of our homes and loved ones and those with whom we work and share our leisure time. May we be faithful and truthful in all our dealings and give us empathy with each other's needs and hopes. And we pray especially for our young people and children whose inheritance is this beautiful and flawed world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Spirit of God, we give you thanks for the gift of life you breathe into us. And all the gracious gifts you bestow on us in our poverty of spirit. We pray for all who are in straitened circumstances and for blessings to flow as from an underground stream and not wait to trickle down. We remember those whose lives are restricted by illness or circumstance and those hindered by the hurts of life that only Christ can heal. We lift before you those whom we know who are ill. We pray for Chris and John O'Neill's and for Chris's condition to improve. We pray for Steve Barrow and Rosie and their family. And we pray for those known only to ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for those who have passed through pain and suffering and are now where sorrow and pain are no more and for all those who have experienced the power of your resurrection. And at this time, we pray especially for Vera Elton, Maureen Cotton, and Anne Crump. And for those whom we have loved, whose anniversary falls at this time. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. <coughs> Thank you, Wendy. Uh, we, we prayed for, for, for Chris there, and actually we've come to our time of notices, but, but John, you wanted to come up and... Go there. Yeah. As a church family, we know that God is love, and we know that God answers prayer. But God also gives us surprises. And the surprise for me this morning was in our first hymn, in verse 4. Let your mercy be our measure to meet our neighbour's needs. And I really give 
all of you a heartfelt thanks from both Chris and I for all the support, help, offers of assistance, driving, little food for when I've returned back from hospital late at night, because you've put Christian love into real activity. You have shown in your actions just how much Christian life is and how much better we all are through Christian life. And I do want to thank the ministry team for their love, compassion and care, for the pastoral team, likewise, and to all you individuals that have been so good in blessing both Chris and myself. She's still in hospital. She continues to make slow but steady progress, but we now wait for the next recommencement of her infusion, uh, which will be whether, in fact, she is able to carry on with the level of uh, chemotherapy that they're giving her. And we'll know that later this week. So please keep us in your prayers. Thank you for all those prayers you've given us. They are much appreciated, and really, we take them to heart. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, you will continue in our prayers and in our love. Um, um, just as we uh, come to share another uh, odd message, I won't. Um, there's lots in here. Uh, do please uh, take a look through it. Um, one thing I'll just draw attention to is uh, in, towards the end of this month is, is Halloween, uh, 31st of uh, October. And as a church family, we're going to be putting on a light party. Um, so Halloween is something that has, has shifted towards something which celebrates the darkness, uh, whereas obviously we want to be celebrating the light that shines into the darkness. Uh, so that's something that we're going to be doing, particularly with an eye to, uh, to young families across the village. So do be praying for that. Um, uh, also, if you feel like you'd be in a position to be able to help with the, the activities and, and be part of the team that, that runs that, do please see Jan um, or, or send her an email. Uh, another thing which... Uh, if you have any jam jars, uh, which uh, uh, I'm sure many of us do, please do bring them and pop. There's a box at the back of church. Um, they're going to be used for one of the crafts that, that we do. Uh, so if you have any spare, um, if you've finished your jam, please do bring those along and they'll be a great help to us. But uh, as we move uh, towards uh, well, the rest of our service, um, uh, God will speak peace to his people. Uh, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Uh, the peace of the Lord uh, be always with you. And also with you. Uh, why don't we offer a sign of peace uh, to one another as we, uh, uh, as we... Oh yeah, I should have got you to stand. My apologies. There we go. Well done. You're better than this and I am. Um, you know the drill. Uh, let's... Uh, uh, um, Let's stand, continue standing to sing our, uh, our next hymn, 537, uh, For the Beauty of the Earth.
Sisters and brothers, turning to page 14 in the service booklets, let's join together in our first communion prayer. The Lord is with you. It's with us. <laughs> let's do that again. The Lord is with us. I'm not getting this right, am I? Let me, let me read the words. That make a difference. The Lord is here. So lift up your hearts. Let us together give thanks to the Lord our God. Please do be seated as we pray. It is so right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but you came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is shed for you for forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. So as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, Send your Holy Spirit, that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. So with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise, and we lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share together in the body of Christ. For though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread.
Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Lord I'm I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word. Twenty-two, uh, we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Our final hymn uh, is hymn 532, All Creatures of Our God and King, and we're going to be omitting the star verses. Uh, so let's stand and sing.
there behind afterwards for, for tea and coffee. Um, but as we go, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name, in the name of, of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.